Okay, we are alive. Welcome to the May meeting of the North Jersey Astronomical Group. My name is Kevin Kadan. I'm pres president of the club. And uh, before we get started with our speakers uh, tonight, uh, I just want to mention that we do have a nice astronomical event happening uh, soon. Uh, next month in June, uh, we do have a solar eclipse coming up. Uh, many of you may remember the great uh, eclipse that we had uh, back in 2017. And uh, we got to see at least a, piece, a little piece of that uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, but um, this uh, particular uh, eclipse is happening at sunrise. And so it's gonna be a difficult event to view. Uh, we're not gonna see the whole thing, but it is a fairly deep eclipse. Uh, if I remember correctly, the moon is gonna cover uh, something like around 80% of the sun is gonna be covered by the moon. Uh, and so it's gonna be kind of a neat thing. If the weather cooperates, we'll be able to see an eclipsed sun rising up in the eastern or northeastern sky uh, at sunrise. So it's kind of a spectacular sunrise uh, uh, event. Uh, but because you know trees and buildings around here in New Jersey get in the way, uh, you do have to find a good spot where you have a clear view of the horizon to the northeast. And so where is that? Well, you're gonna have to look around. You have to look around and see. Uh, you've got a couple of weeks here to figure out uh, where you can go. Certainly all along the Jersey shore is a fantastic place to go. There's a nice flat horizons as you look out over the ocean. Uh, and so uh, that's a good place to scout for some locations. Uh, hey, so Kevin, what about a water ball? I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Uh, on campus, Mary Lou, you know Bone Hall? Yes. Uh, on Montclair. Yeah, uh, well, on the I, well, I don't know if you can get there, especially the general public, because I know I don't know how, how, what Montclair State is doing, but not all the colleges, secure, they're pretty secure. They're pretty locked down at this point. I, I was up there once for uh, fireworks. A friend of mine was a cop there, so... <laughs> Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, any place that you can find that has a good view of the northeast horizon is going to be a good place to go. Now, uh, for our club, for NJG, um, we're, we're really not quite ready to do a full-fledged public event uh, for this, unfortunately. You know, people are still getting vaccinated and the public is getting vaccinated. We're not quite there yet where we're, I think we're ready for a public event. But uh, we are working on a plan to uh, secure us a, a spot where some of our members can set up a couple of telescopes and we're gonna try a live broadcast. So even if you can't see it in person, uh, we hopefully will be able to broadcast that. And so uh, our plans are not completely finalized yet, but uh, that's what we're planning. And so I just wanted to let people know about that. Okay, so, um, let me uh, let let us get started. We're going to turn this over to uh, Mary Lou West. Uh, uh, she's going to introduce some of our speakers for tonight. We have some really exciting uh, presentations by uh, some students from Montclair and Scranton. And so, uh, uh, Mary Lou, you want to? So our meeting every May has been for many years. Uh, students giving reports on whatever projects they've been able to do, whatever sort of research they've been able to do this uh, the previous year. So um, this year has been very difficult for people to do any sort of uh, research with material or with equipment uh, because it's been locked down for a lot of things, but I'm really pleased that some people have been able to do some things. So we have uh, three talks by people from Montclair State University and then two talks by students from Scranton University. So uh, the, the first talk we're gonna have is Anthony Gachetti talking about uh, Earth's paleoclimate records. Then John Naughty and Jonathan Rays talking about LIGO upgrades. Then Claudia Barone talking about transparent conductors for applications to space technologies. Get her out in space there. Uh, then we move to Scranton and Veronica Romanek is gonna talk about Doppler observations of traveling ionospheric disturbances and how you can measure those. And Shaf Sawar is gonna talk about experimental design for the Scranton Radio Telescope. So it's quite a lot of interesting, very different things. Uh, we're asking each group to talk for only 10 to 15 minutes. And um, it would be best, I think, if you could hold your questions to the end of each student's talk and then they could 
questions at that point. You could always type questions into the, the chat box uh, or just at that point, um, we'll let people ask them out loud. So uh, first, uh, Anthony, using Earth's paleoclimate records, do you better predict future climate change? How will this help us? Go for it. All right, just share my screen real quick. All right, all good? Got it. Okay. So the overall goal of our project is essentially to use Earth's paleoclimate record to better understand what's happening right now with our current climate crisis. Ooh. There we go. <laughs> so right now, our current climate models are showing around a two to three degrees temperature increase. These are sea surface temperature changes over the next 40 to 80 years. Now, this data over here is from NOAA, and it's the most accurate prediction that we have at our current state. Unfortunately, though, most of our modern climate models are using this really, really recent climate data, and it's just insufficient in predicting how the Earth is actually going to respond to climate change. So we need to look into the paleoclimate record to fill in that really big research gap. So the period of time that we're looking at, it has a very long, fancy name, the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. We just call it the PETM for short. So this was a really large global warming event that occurred 56 million years ago, and there was a global temperature increase of around five to six degrees Celsius, and ocean levels were over 100 meters from where they are today. Just to give you a little bit of context, the Statue of Liberty wouldn't just be surrounded by water, it would actually be submerged by several meters if we got to that state right now. All right, so one thing not a lot of people are aware of is where most carbon on Earth is actually buried. So 90% of it is buried in what we call shallow marine environments. Now, 56 million years ago, the continents weren't really in the shape we know and love today. They're almost there, but they were still getting into the swing of things. So there was this really large seaway right here called the Tethys Sea. And it was a really, really important source of both heat and moisture because it's a very significant shallow marine environment. And even despite that, it's a very poorly understood region and nobody's really looked at this spot before. And you're probably thinking like, oh my gosh, that's absolutely insane. Like, this is so important. Why is nobody looking at it? We felt the same exact thing, and that's why we're looking at it. All right, so how did we actually do it? We had a lot of information to gather, and we've been working over this for a very long period of time. But to start, we collected 480 mudstone samples from a site in Xinjiang, China. Now, we collect them at 10 centimeter increments, so we'd have a very large degree of accuracy and precision. And we're covering 200,000 years of climate data preserved in the mudstone. So first of all, we use the mass spectrometer, which is right over here to gather trace element data, major earth processing runs, and a bunch of other information like oxygen isotopes and carbon isotopes. Now, carbon isotopes, they can be used to figure out how much carbon was actually emitted into the atmosphere. Meanwhile, oxygen isotopes, they can be kind of used as like a paleo thermometer, if you will. So by looking at the oxygen isotopes, more specifically the ratio of oxygen isotopes, we can see exactly what the temperature is and make those more accurate predictions. Now, these little guys over here are nanofossils. The reason why we looked at our samples and we got these really cool pictures of all these nanofossils. Now, just looking at them, it might just look like a bunch of stuff, but no, these are really, really important little guys. Now, what these did, they essentially proved that the site that we're looking at is the PETM because it would really suck if we were looking at all this data and it wasn't even indicative of the PETM. So by identifying these certain fossils that are only found in that period of time, we proved that there's a really, really high resolution record in this site. So what have we actually learned from the data that we collected? So concentrations of things like copper and cobalt show that there's a very large increase in nutrients in the ocean. Now, when you have too many nutrients in the ocean, you get really large algal blooms. They take up all the oxygen and you get these things called dead zones. It's something we're already seeing in our ocean right now with pollution and climate change as a whole, but we've also proven it through manganese isotopes, which is something we collected from the trace element data and shown that there was a really, really large anoxic environment and it's being replicated today. So one of the scariest things that we have learned from this is the current carbon emission rates. So right now our current carbon emission rates are actually 10 times higher than the ones that we observed in the PETM. So when we're adjusting these paleoclimate records to the modern climate data, we need to essentially multiply it, which is really scary because this already happened in a very condensed period of time. And we're looking at halfway of that point within the next 40 to 80 years. So as you can see on the right, exactly like I was saying before, we're already getting to halfway of the point of the PETM within our lifetimes alone. And this has filled in a really essential research gap in the paleoclimate record. And we're gonna have a much more accurate understanding of the speed, the impact, 
and the paleoclimate record in the response to the environmental warming. Now, going forward, we're going to be looking at a lot of different things, correcting climate models, allowing resources to be much better managed, and we'll have a much more accurate picture in terms of how we can actually get through the catastrophe, because like it or not, it is coming and we need to adjust for that and accommodate for it. And we are kind of past the point in no return in some aspects. So we definitely do need to accommodate for that by looking at the paleoclimate record and seeing exactly what things need to be done to preserve ecosystems and ourselves. And then just of course, in closing, we'd like to thank the National Science Foundation because without them, we wouldn't have been able to do this project and the College of Science and Mathematics at Montclair because they're the best. <laughs> Wow, that's very cool. Who are the people in the lower right? So these are actually the people that went out and collected the samples from the site. So this is Dr. Shui's crew. This right here is me over in the isotope lab this year. Um, so even with the pandemic, we just worked on reduced occupancy within the lab and we were still able to work in a very in-person capacity. So we were still able to process all the samples in a normal capacity. We just arranged our hours very, very delicately. Good idea. Good idea. I have a, a, a question actually about uh, the anoxic environments uh, that we have now and uh, the ones we saw in the PETM. Um, obviously we're warming at a much faster rate than during that time. <clears throat> what are the implications, and this is maybe potentially for lay people, uh, what are the implications, obviously, for oceanic life, but not, not just oceanic life, but life on land, if this continues? No, that's a fantastic question. So one thing I didn't talk about is what we call the chemical index of alteration. Essentially, mm -hmm. as you increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, but also within the water as it grows more acidic and like kind of sinks in there, it causes a lot more weathering of the environment and it erodes things. So that's where all those nutrients are coming from. They're literally being pulled directly from rock samples and from all the mudstones surrounding the ocean. So when all those nutrients go in, there's a bunch of ways that nutrients can get in the water. Like obviously it happened naturally through the PETM as everything was pulled in, but it can also happen in terms of things like pollutants and other environmental hazards that are just purely human related. Now, when all those nutrients go in there, it causes very, very large algal blooms because essentially you're feeding these algal blooms with as much food as they can possibly eat and they're mass producing themselves. And they're taking up all this oxygen because the algae, they're eating all this oxygen or they're eating all the nutrients, they're eating up all the oxygen and there's no oxygen in the water for the fish to breathe. So it causes these massive dead zones. And what we're finding by studying dead zones caused by pollution is that they're really, really hard to recover from looking at the paleoclimate record and looking at fossil species, you can see entire species were wiped out just because of these specific dead zones. So when you have a certain, you know, a species of whatever in a certain given area, if that becomes a dead zone, that entire species ceases, ceases to exist. So by studying the dead zones, we can see exactly which species are going extinct and the speed that they're going extinct as well, because dead zones have more impact on some things and less impact on others. The Chesapeake Bay is a great example. There is a lot of dead zones in the Chesapeake Bay, but there's crabs all over the place. They can survive dead zones very, very well. Same thing with jellyfish. Actually, if you see a bunch of jellyfish in the water, that's a very large indicator that the water is not super, super clean. It's probably a dead zone because only species like crabs and jellyfish are able to survive in those really deadly environments. So take that a step further. Um... What does that mean for, for humans? I know obviously humans consume the food that are in there and perhaps maybe certain types of fish will disappear and other ones will wind up on your dinner plate later on, maybe less desirable ones. But what other types of uh, dangers are we talking about up the food chain, up to the human level? I mean, definitely in terms of pollutants, like you said, like certain species have a lot more bioaccumulation. And unfortunately, the species that do accumulate things like, you know, mercury lead and a lot of other dangerous toxins happen to be the ones that are usually surviving in those dead zones. And it kind of feeds a negative feedback loop. As you lose one species, it completely throws off the ecosystem. So like, say we lose tuna. 
Okay, that tuna is gone. Then that'll lead to a bunch of other fish dying off. That'll lead to no more sardines, no more anchovies, and like all these other different fish life and all these creatures are dying off. So it's a massive disruption to the food chain. And yeah. not only that, it's just, it, it just kind of spirals and it keeps on going off. And the right. longer it goes on, the harder it gets to repair it because the ocean right. eventually just becomes too toxic to live in or evolve to. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question. So okay. I noticed in the chart, obviously there's continental drift. So there was differences in ocean currents and gyres and all that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there. So <clears throat> climate is very much affected by how these gyres are changed, the currents. So are we able to say, okay, the currents back in this region are like this, and now they're like this. So is there gonna be the same amount of change per degree of increase as we see today? Are you able to make that correlation even though there's different um, geography on the earth? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the main things with that is just looking directly at sea surface temperature. Sea surface temperature is something that's really, really affected by, you know, ocean currents, because even if you have a very warm environment in one spot like the Tepe Sea, if it's being, you know, drifted away by a very cold current, then the sea surface temperature isn't necessarily going to reflect that same degree of warming. So we do have very, very accurate, you know, models of what the Tepe Sea and what this entire environment looked like, because Geologically speaking, 56 million years ago really isn't that long of a time. So we are able to apply a lot of our current climate models or in terms of you know currents within the ocean to what we're seeing here. The main thing that we need to accommodate for is just the seaway right here because all the gyres in this region and all the gyres in this region are affected by the tepes. But for the most part, it is an enclosed seaway. And as it kind of you know built in further and further and further, it just closed that seaway more and more. So it is something that is very easily applicable to today because again, it's something that's very, very recent. Interesting. Okay, so I think it's time to move on to uh, the next talk. Uh, John and Jonathan are gonna talk to us about a better look at the universe through LIGO. So go for it. Hello, all right, I'm gonna, oh, uh, when I can share my screen, I will. All right. All right, um, I'm John Note, and uh, me and John, Jonathan Reyes, are going to be giving you uh, insight on the research that we've been doing for LIGO, uh, and specifically on the low loss Faraday isolators for their A-plus upgrade. But before we get into that, we have to discuss what we're actually detecting, gravitational waves. And to do that, uh, John is going to start us off. Hey, hi there. So um, I'm Jonathan Reyes. And basically, the first instance of gravitational waves um, was predicted by the famed Albert Einstein by the means of using the theory of relativity. And so really quickly, I just want to give you a brief summary on what exactly gravitational waves are. Yeah, you can um, imagine gravitational waves to be like ripples or really literally just like waves flowing through space itself that kind of contract and expand through everything that they pass through. They're, in, they're completely invisible to us. However, they have like a very real effect on the universe as a whole. The most significant part about gravitational waves is that regardless of what they pass through, there, there is little to no scattering of the waves itself, which means that when we're gathering data from them, it's very like clear, very precise. I mean, not precise is not the best word, but it's very clear and there's no like damage to it. The, the data gleaned from these waves can teach us just a lot about the universe and the things that they originated from, be they the black holes that, that like, mer like merges of black holes or extremely dense neutron stars. So LIGO stands for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, what they do is they use these four kilometer long um, Michelson's interferometers. And what an interferometer does is it uses two or more light sources in order to create an interference pattern where if you could see on this little Lego um, setup that we have here, uh, we would have a sensor at the end. And if these uh, 
these two arms of the LIGO project itself are at the same distance, we would get an interference pattern that would lead, that would leak out zero readings, right? Now, as John explained, when gravitational waves come in, they, they condense and bend matter. And when they bend and condense either side of these arms, that, that interference pattern is no longer at zero. And with it not being at zero, we then get readings. And from there, we can detect and measure these gravitational waves. And there are, there are two major facilities for LIGO. Um, one of them is in Livingston, Louisiana, and the other one is in Richland, Washington. Both of these facilities are, have two arms that are four kilometers in length, and they can both measure extremely accurately. Um, as you can see on the slide, uh, up to one ten thousandth the size of a pro proton, which would be likely, it, it would be like measuring the distance to the nearest star with the accuracy smaller than the width of human hair. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're working with the, the low loss Faraday isolators. Um, so firstly, a Faraday isolator uses polarization to prevent the beams from returning light that's pa that is passing through it. This allows um, for the beam to be like extra precise and also protects the laser itself from any external risk of damage, like such as if the laser light was to like bounce back into the, the source itself, that could really mess up the laser itself, which we don't want to happen. And um, so I'm just gonna tell you about polarization very quickly. Polarization is something that can be utilized to act as well, a almost like a one-way window or even sunglasses where it only allows for some light or no light to pass through in like a certain direction. So that we have like the desired um, scattering that we want. Um, so Faraday isolators are derived from Faraday rotators, which operate by generating a magnetic field. And that magnetic field flows in the same direction as like the laser light that we're shining through it. And uh, really quickly, as you can see there, there's um, a, a very notable formula. This is um, for the rotator, which is beta equals VBL, where beta is the total rotation angle. V is the verdant constant of the material that we're using. B is the magnetic flux. And L is just the length of the medium that we're working with at the time. So LIGO's A plus upgrade is what we're currently working on. Uh, for that fair, for the Faraday isolators. By 2024, they want to completely complete this upgrade. It is a 20 plus million dollar plan to upgrade its technologies. And this plan calls for 99% transmission through these Faraday isolators. Now, that would give us about five times the detection rate and also more accuracy. Currently, LIGO is in the advanced LIGO stage which they thought was, was, which was a major upgrade from what they had previously. But with this new upgrade, we can measure even, even uh, smaller gravitational waves from further out and we can see more and more about our universe. Um, so what we did, basically our job was to um, characterize the varying components of the isolate, isolators. When characterization was complete, we would get to work. This was done through the manner of firing an infrared laser. The laser's light was shown through a polarizing uh, filter before being directed through the medium that we wanted to test. In, in doing this, we were able to yield the most accurate results possible by reducing extra noise and scattering. Um, it should also be noted that the laser we're using is at the same wavelength as the one actually used in LIGO, which is 1064 nanometers, which is infrared light. And um, when we're seeking our data, we considered a multiple, a multitude of different variables and trials. So that way we were sure we had the best and most accurate results. So the first two crystals that we worked on were the KTP, the potassium titanyl phosphate crystals and the fused silica. If you look down at these, uh, the graphs for both of these graphs, what we have is um, the reflectance versus the angle, because at a certain angle, we get the, the, the most amount of transmittance. And as I said before, that's something that we're looking for in this A plus upgrade. Um, and this is the reflectance in PPM, which stands for parts per, per million, which is basically if you have 1 million light photons hitting this, it's going to reflect this many particles. So over here uh, for the KTP crystal, if you look at the very bottom, we measured to about 2.5 parts per million, 
which is incredible and and well within what we what we need it to be and want it to be both of these uh uh types of crystals gave us very little uh trouble and we measured obviously both sides and um continued on from there and sent our results into LIGO. Next on we had uh TTG and the quartz rotator or TTG stands for a uh, terbium gallium garnet but first I'll talk about the quartz rotator when working with the quartz rotator we were searching for something a little different called the uh AR reflectance, which stands for anti-reflectance, and um, as well as the polarization. For like the rotation, we selected the polarization from a half wave plate, so that way we could extinguish one of the beams because we were having multiple beams shown through. And uh, simply put, we were just measuring the amount of power that was being generated from that beam. We continued on by, by then blocking the other beam and then measuring the power that was generated from that beam. And we saw that our results were almost perfect. They were just really great. And then below, you can see that there's a graph there that represents like a linear fit that shows you know, the incident power versus the reflected power. And the data is at a range between negative two degrees to two degrees. So just very like within the range that we're seeking out. And then next, we basically did the same exact thing for the TGG, where we measured the anti-reflectance of it. And we just followed the same results. And you can see on that graph that, once again, we had some very desirable results. And it just we're very happy with what we've been seeing so far. Next, we have, um, <clears throat> next we have the uh, thin film polarizer. And for this, we not only measured the reflectance of, of P polarization, but the transmission of S polarization. Now, as John said before, describing polarization, uh, T and S, uh, I'm sorry, P and S polarizations, they're basically just 90 degrees from each other. So think about if a polarized beam is going this way and it's only being shown this way, if that was P polarization, S polarization would kind of be perpendicular to that. Um, so we did those measurements and while we, while we did those measurements, we, we came into some trouble. This was actually the, the, the troubled child of, of all of our things. Turns out that we had some elliptical polarization that was being caused from um, our beam splitter being about two millimeters higher than the rest of our setup. And of course we could fix that by changing the height of that, but that is very difficult to do with, with those very precise measurements and everything. So what we did instead is we put another calcite wedge polarizer and that was able, as you could see in, in this diagram down here, that was able to uh, split the light into those different polarizations and we can measure the correct one each time. But once we did that, we found yet again that it was well within what we were looking for. So our final results, we found that with perfect alignment of the output Faraday isolator specifically, we would get less than 0.4% loss from all sources such as scattering and absorption. And once we sent down our things for the squeezer isolator uh, to Florida, they assembled it and they found only 0.62% loss. Both of these are well within the A plus upgrade standards, which was of course 1% loss total. At this point, we will take any questions. So I have a question. So the polarization is, is linear polarization rather than circular, right or left-handed? Yes, yes, it is linear polarization. Hmm. Where did you get these crystals from? So um, there's a bunch of different sources that they go through. Um, I'm not 100% sure exactly where they're ordered from, Dr. Martin does more of that. They are very expensive. Um, <laughs> and uh, they kind of, they, they order a crystal, then they send it to a certain lab to get the, the anti-reflective coating. And then if the results are good, that's a place that they will use again in the future is pretty much how that works. But uh, as far as the gonna say Amazon. location, I'm not certain. <laughs> cool. Any other questions? Well, that's uh, you know, pretty exciting uh, that uh, yeah. you say that these kinds of upgrades will uh, allow, what was it, a factor of five? 
yes more sensitive uh, or or uh, more more sensitive in terms of um, smaller gravitational waves that you can detect uh, and that's pretty cool you know um uh, I, I can't remember who, who the speaker was, but we had a presentation about uh, LIGO uh, a, a while back, it might have been a couple of years ago. And it was really interesting to note that uh, gravitational wave uh, science got started here in New Jersey, basically. Uh, the guy who started that was Joseph Weber, who was born in Patterson. And uh, you know, he built these big Weber bars, the big uh, tubes of aluminum to try to detect these uh, gravitational waves, which he was never really successful in doing because his equipment was not sensitive enough as LIGO has shown us how sensitive you have to be in order to detect these uh, minor fluctuations. But uh, it's kind of kind of cool to think that uh, uh, New Jersey had a little role there in uh, <laughs> you know, gravitational astronomy, you know. Definitely, oh, definitely. It's so very exciting cool. for sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Yes. What do we hope to learn from studying gravitational waves? Well, so uh, as we said in the beginning, since gravitational waves can pass through uh, intervening matter uh, without being scattered, unlike light or, or other ways of detecting these massive um, happenings in space, uh, we can tell way more about black holes and other things than we ever thought possible, which could actually show us a lot about our universe in general. Um, one of the things, one of the recent discoveries that LIGO actually made was these two massive black holes collided. And one of them had a, had a mass that was much larger than anything we ever thought possible. So it's kind of like breaking down some of the fundamental, um, some of the fundamental thoughts within uh, gravitational physics and making us question them and figure them out better and better. And it could even lead to finding a potential uh, gravitational wave background of the universe, which is something that is believed to exist. Okay, thank you. So once somebody discovers a black hole of very larger mass than thought, uh, then the uh, astronomers who do models of stellar evolution have to get busy and try to figure out some star that could have given rise to that. Aha. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, really quick. The uh, the new A plus upgrade. I mean, uh, we were at a, a level where we were able to detect um, gravitational waves from neutron stars colliding. So I guess we're going from you know larger events to smaller ones. This new upgrade. What what would we be able to detect? You know. Speaking out from a smaller neutron star or, or something, you know, that, to give us context. I think um, more likely. So one of the big things about the upgrade is that we're going to be able to um, have a greater detection rate. So we'll actually not only be able to detect um, smaller waves, but we'll also be able to uh, detect more often and, uh, you know, keep the machine running and everything on and everything going. Um, right. However, I think the idea behind the sensitivity being greater is more about things further out in the universe being detected. Right. So oh, obviously, okay. as these waves propagate, um, they get smaller and smaller, which is why we don't feel them or see them or anything like that. Um, so the more sensitive we are, the further away we can detect things and the more we can know about what's happening beyond what we can see, possibly. So in that respect, closer to the time of the Big Bang. Yes, yes. Right. Okay, thank you. Very exciting, cool stuff. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Claudia Barone, transparent conductors for applications to space technologies. Hmm. Okay. Hi. Um, so my name is Claudia Barone. Uh, I actually already graduated from Montclair State, uh, but I'm continuing with this because um, I think it's super interesting and really important. So um, I just like to hang around. So my research is in transparent conductors for applications to space technologies. 
Um, I work with Dr. Martin. I actually work in the same lab next to John and Jonathan. So that's a lot of fun. Um, so uh, this sounds like a very long, big title, but what am I even researching? So uh, what is a transparent conductor? Um, it's basically just any layer of glass coated with some sort of thin film. And the film has little to no obstruction to visible light. So um, it's also something that has very low electrical resistance, so allows electricity to flow easily. Um, so some examples of this that you see really often that you probably don't even realize are transparent conductors is um, a touchscreen device. So an iPhone, a phone screen, um, electrodes for solar cells, um, low emissivity windows, um, LCD screens. So a screen that allows for a backlit display. That would be an example of a transparent conductor. Really just anything that allows light to travel through and also the flow of electricity. So why are we researching this? Well, this was brought on, um, Dr. Martin approached, approached me with this and I just thought it was so interesting that transparent conductors are not new to space. They are used in space already. However, they are pretty expensive. So like anything else, if you can find a cheaper way to do it, why not? Um, so we just thought it would be useful to um, look into cheaper options and possibly more effective options. So um, Transparent conductors currently are usually indium tin oxide, so ITOs, and they are pretty expensive. They work and they're effective, but they are pretty expensive. So on the quest to find a cheaper one, we're also on the quest to find something with higher efficiency. Um, and it's still in the process of figuring that out. But that's what this testing is really based on. So um, some promising replacements that we have been looking into are um, gallium doped zinc oxide, so Z, uh, GZO, excuse me, and aluminum doped zinc oxide, so AZOs, uh, in replacement to the ITOs that are already currently in use. So again, um, really much lower costs for this, especially in bulk quantities and higher effic uh, efficiency. So just looking to um, fix a couple of problems and, um, and allows for more uses of the material. Obviously, if it's cheaper, it's more available. Um, so yeah. Uh, so getting into experimenting, we, we actually started, I started in the lab in August. And since then, I have basically lived at this machine. So um, we are investigating the effects of gold ion beam irradiation on optical and electrical properties of thin GZO films um, that mimic space bombardment. So um, the equipment that we use, so the um, white machine that kind of looks like a printer, that is the Perkin Elmer Lambda 650 spectrometer. Um, and that is a spectrometer that we do reflectance and transmission for our samples, which are just small glass samples with thin coating on the top. And um, the other cool machine is um, the commercial Hall effect system. So that is used with liquid nitrogen to cool to very uh, low temperatures. Um, so we performed measurements of reflectance and transmission um, for UV and visible light and um, also of carrier, oh, sorry, I had to move some people, <laughs> um, of carrier concentration and resistivity with the Hall effect system. So uh, we have some collaborators from different places that help us get these samples because we're not able to do it all here. So um, we do have collaborators from Japan and Romania so we get the samples from Japan and then they're sent to Romania to be bombarded with these gold atoms um, or gold ions, excuse me. So they're irradiated and then they come back and um, that's where we are kind of sent to study them. So even though they are irradiated, they're not radioactive at all. Um, gold is very stable, so it's not a risky, risky business testing these. <laughs> So um, this is, so the picture itself is of the inside of the spectrometer, and this would be the reflectance stage of testing. So we actually tested all of the samples for reflectance first, and then moved on to transmission. 
and then we kind of went back to reflectance for smaller, more uh, kind of broken samples. Um, some of them did break, and um, I'll ex kind of explain why that happens in a second. We're very careful with them, but things happen. Um, so we tested in this specific position for um, reflectance. So the spectrometer was set to test from 180 nanometers to 900 nanometers. We actually continued this experiment with Dr. Martin's husband, who we lovingly referred to as Mr. Dr. Martin in the lab. He has a lab at uh, Ramapo College where we have sent them to be continued past 900 nanometers. So we do the very beginning of this and he does kind of the longer end of it. Um, so for reflectance, the sample is placed on those three metal points and we close the lid so that it's completely dark and then um, the light is shined through to see how much light is reflected from the small sample. Again, trans, uh, transparent conductors, the point is for them to be transparent. So we want a lot of visible light to come through. Um, so that is part of the effectiveness is to see if there's a lot of light coming through at different wavelengths. Um, so the data is compared between three samples in each group um, and we had um, I believe five or six groups, um, at least at the time of testing this one uh, section. And so each one has three, one of them is as deposited. So the film is laid on straight from um, the people that we get it from, from Japan to Romania to us, and it's as deposited. And then we have um, two samples that have been bombarded. One of them is um, 15 kgy and the other one is 30 kgy. Um, and that is uh, the, the two that have been disrupted that we are testing to see if they can compare to the same as the original coding. Um, continuing with the experimenting, this time for transmission. So we have a different setup for this. We do have to kind of suspend it. Um, the circle at the side of this um, spectrometer, it is the same spectrometer. We just need to remove a piece from the middle and add the stand in instead. And um, this circle piece over here is where the beam of light is shined through. So it goes right through the center of this. And because we had a couple of broken samples, we did have to um, make sort of a makeshift setup here. So these are just a couple of pictures of our setup and it was held together with um, two slides um, and just a little bit of tape. And we were able to get it into a good position to get the light to cover the entirety of um, the sample because it is kind of a beam of light that's uh, in a strip. It's not just a point. So we need to cover the entire thing with the sample or we would have to start over again. Um, so the level of light was never changed. We just adjusted the stand to be higher or lower. Uh, and again, the broken samples, we kind of just had to tape up a little more, but we were able to kind of maneuver them into a position that worked. Again, we tested all three samples for each group. So the data collection from the spectrometer. Um, so this is just an example of our JB data. So JB is just one of the groups that we tested with an as deposited a 15 kgy and a 30 kgy sample. Um, kgy does stand for, um, I forgot. Oh, uh, excuse me, kilogram which is just a unit of irradiation. So that's just how these are measured. Um, and so there, we use them to compare to each other just to, um, to see how, again, how they compare to the as deposited version. And we do have a mirror that we run through the machine before we run any of our samples in order to test 100% reflectance um, so that we can compare it to a full reflective mirror. Um, so the graphs show a lot of similarities with um, their curves and that's a good sign because they're relatively close. It could be a lot worse. Um, and the very low uh, curves on this graph that seem to not really follow anything, those are our tests. So what we do is actually flip the sample upside down to make sure that we are testing the right side of the sample that has the coated film on it. Um, so we flip it to the plain glass side when we do these so that we can assure that they don't look like the rest of our curves and we know that we are testing the proper side. So that's why that one kind of dips a little lower, but 
Um, so this is percent reflectance by um, wavelength, and um, some of them are higher than others. This was several tests that we did. Um, so the as deposited as deposited does act the most um, closely to full reflectance, as close as we can really get it, um, and the other to the uh, 15 and the 30 KGY both differ a little bit, but this is still pretty um, consistent data. So it's not, um, it is um, still good data. So this is um, the testing for the Hall effect. Um, it, it looks, you have to look pretty closely, but that small sample of glass um, is not actually the size of the square, but inside here. So they're very small. And this is how we broke a couple of samples. So um, these four probes need to be placed very carefully in place so that they can measure um, both the current and the voltage. Um, it's actually um, the Vanderpaw technique. So these two um, that are crosswise measure voltage, and these two that are crosswise in the opposite direction um, measure current. So that is a technique that allows us to measure both at the same time. Um, however, it applies so much pressure on our samples that oftentimes they do break. So um, we had to kind of go back to our reflectance stage for our spectrometer and kind of, um, we actually used a razor blade covered in black tape to um, prevent any light from reflecting. And we had to place it on a very small slit of a razor blade to get the smallest samples read. Um, we did manage to do it, just took lots and lots of trial and error. Um, so this is then loaded into that chamber that was kind of a frosted chamber and then cooled to very low temperatures in order to measure. So these are our results from the UV and visual light um, reflectance and transmission. So as you can see, um, the red one, which is our as deposited, so it's zero kgy, um, that one obviously is going to be the best graph. Um, ideally, all of them would have been perfect, but um, these are not perfect. They are bombarded with gold ions, so we were expecting some drop. Um, but the red is actually pretty close to our green and our blue, so uh, it, it's good data and it's consistent uh, and it's promising. So um, that's very good. And then we have the results, um, broadband and transport data. So um, in this graph, you can also see that things are very close together here. So um, there is there is obviously some discrepancies between the three of them, but not much. So they're very close. Um, and the films remain conducted after the irradiation uh, and the carrier concentration does not change that much. So um, that's good news. Um, so as you can see in this chart, um, the resistivity, so we're checking to make sure that there's no loss in resistivity. Um, and the resistivity is um, for the 30 kGy is um, two times 10 to the negative fourth. Um, and for copper, typically it would be, um, I believe seven times 10 to the negative fourth. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that number because we did not test that. Um, but this, this is good news that it's, uh, the receivity is much lower. So it retains that. Um, and just some conclusions. So the irradiation reduces the transmission slightly, but it's still good trans, uh, transparency in um, the visual. Um, the reflectance is not really affected that much. So the absorption of the film does not really change. Um, and we want low absorption and we got low absorption of light, which is really good news. So um, the absorption edge consistently shifts from the UV towards the visible, narrowing slightly um, the transmission window, but visible range is not affected. Um, and so we are still currently uh, analyzing a lot of this. <laughs> So we have lots and lots of data from all of our samples, but as I said, um, you know, some samples were broken and a lot of times we had to recalibrate the machine. So, um, because we just wanted to get the most accurate data as possible. So we do have lots of data. So quantitative analysis of the band gap is um, in progress and the band gap is um, the distance or um, the gap between this as deposited and the other samples. So I think I forgot to mention that, but so that's the band gap. So we are trying to analyze that still. 
um, between all of these. Um, there's just lots of data to get through, um, but this overall is really promising. So um, it's, it's promising data and it's looking good. Just again, we need to finish getting through it. But if things continue on this path, I think it'll be good. And that's it. Very good. Thank you. Very interesting. Any questions? Well, this is this is really very neat stuff. Thank you very much, Claudia. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good. So can we move on to Veronica Romanek, uh, high frequency Doppler observations of traveling ionospheric disturbances and the personal space weather system. Veronica. Um, okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, okay. Okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, awesome. Hello, I'm Veronica. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, a lot of interesting talks so far. Um, so I will be talking about uh, the research I've been doing with high frequency Doppler observations of traveling ionospheric disturbances and a WWV signal received with a network of low cost HAMSI personal space weather stations. So a brief outline of what I will be talking about is what are TIDs, how do we detect them, what is the Great Personal Space Weather Station, how does it work, and what can we learn from the data? So a brief introduction to what I will be talking about. Um, in order to understand what I'm doing here, it's important to have an understanding of radio waves. Uh, so for our purposes, we can consider them to be a type of electromagnetic wave that is generated by a transmitter. These waves can get refracted off of the ionosphere um, and then eventually received by receivers. One such receiver is the Great Personal Space Weather Station. Um, I have one of these set up at my house and I'm using it to detect TIDs or traveling ionospheric disturbances, which can be defined as moving irregularities of charged particles in Earth's atmosphere. So what is the GRAPE? The GRAPE was developed by a group of people known as the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation, or HAMSI, um, at Case Western. It is essentially a small measurement platform that can be used to make ground-based observations of the space environment. And there are currently 15 GRAPEs set up and collecting data throughout the United States. The one that I'm talking about in this presentation is located in northwestern New Jersey. Um, at my house. If you're familiar with ham radio, my call sign is KD2UHN. Um, and if you're not, this is just essentially a set of letters and numbers that correlate with uh, a grid square uh, where I'm located. And then on the right for reference, I have a picture of the grape. Um, this uh, is about the size of maybe like the palm of your hand or a little bit smaller than a cell phone. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how it works later on. So to understand uh, the specifics of what I'm doing, um, I should probably introduce WWV. WWV is a National Institute of Standards and Technology Standards Station. It has a very accurate uh, frequency and uh, it constantly is transmitting the time. So if you ever turn on the ham radio, you can uh, rely on WWV to tell you what time it is. Um, and a lot of people do, uh, like the military and stuff. So there, I'm sorry, the one that I'm looking at is located in Fort Collins, Colorado, and it outputs a, a number of frequencies. The one that, um, that I'm monitoring with the grape is the 10 megahertz signal. This picture on the right is actually of one of the 15 megahertz towers. It's identical to the 10 megahertz tower. I just couldn't find um, an image subject to public use, but for reference, this is what it looks like. So this is a schematic of the setup I have. Um, on my roof, I have an OCF dipole antenna. Uh, this middle part here, A, is about 30 feet from the ground. Um, I have a wire going through my roof into my room and it connects to the grape. Um, so the grape, as I mentioned, is constantly monitoring the signal from WWV. 
Um, it's also simultaneously monitoring signals from GPS satellites. So on the left here, this is a coaxial cable that connects to the antenna on my roof. And over here is the GPS antenna. I typically have this next to my window, but just for reference in the picture, I moved it over here. Um, and then both antennas connect to a GPS DO, which produced a very stable 9.999 megahertz output. Um, the GPS DO is over here. It's this gray box right here in the back. The output is sent to the receiver board, which mixes the signals to produce a signal of one kilohertz, um, which is this up here. And this is the actual grape here, the, um, the grape receiver board is right here. And then the signal gets sent to a sound card where it's digitized and sent to the Raspberry Pi. So this is the sound card. It gets sent as an analog signal. And then the Pi over here receives it as a digital signal. Um, and then it uses the popular uh, frequency analysis software known as FL Digi to analyze the signal. And then at zero UTC, the grid produces a figure displaying uh, what was seen that day. So I'm located in the Eastern time zone, um, but the grape just for, because it's all over the country, it's easier to use universal time or UTC. So that's why it's output at uh, zero each day. So the results of what I found, um, so this is one of the graphs I was talking about. Um, so you can see here, there's this green box. This green box is outlining a traveling ionospheric disturbance. You can notice there's a uh, sinusoidal pattern here. This can be attributed to a TID. Um, the black line is measuring the Doppler shift and the red line is measuring the signal strength. Uh, for our purposes, we're more so just concerned with the black line. And um, I, this is a very um, early, these are very early results. I just got this set up in January um, and I'm still working on collecting data. But um, I, what I did was I went manually through a bunch of these days and I looked for whenever we see these oscillations and um, I made note of them, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so I was looking at periods of about 15 minutes and amplitudes of about 0.25 Hertz to identify these TIDs. So this is an example of a quiet day. As you can see, there's um, no very obvious oscillations that fit the description of um, like the 0.25 amplitude and the 15 minute period. Um, there is one here at the day a little bit. This is another quiet day. Again, there's no very obvious oscillations until the end. And then this would be an active day. You can see um, these sinusoidal shapes here. And something that I would like to point out is um, in the middle of each day, you see this peak. And at the end of each day, you see this dip. This peak can be attributed to the sunrise and this dip can be attributed to the sunset. And then this is just um, a table of the days um, I, that I went through and I, I looked for oscillations or TIDs. The green boxes highlight, excuse me, the green boxes highlight the, um, the active hours. So times when we saw oscillations or TIDs and the white ones are when it was just the, the zigzaggy line and there was no obvious um, uh, TID behavior. Um, and then the ones that are in bold on the bottom here, uh, these are the total hour, the total active hours um, for that column of hours. So for example, um, zero midpoint local time um, would have like 11 total hours. Um, these totals represent how many active hours there were. And we can see that the data suggests there's a higher period of activity between 15 and 20 midpoint local time. Uh, the reason that I am referring to midpoint local time is because, so WWV is in Colorado, and that's where the signal is being transmitted, and the receiver is at my house in New Jersey. And so the point in which the radio wave actually interacts with the ionosphere, because it, it goes up, and bounces off, and comes to the receiver, um, that's actually halfway between. And so that the region where the radio waves interacting with the ionosphere is in the midpoint local time zone. Um, so that is why we're interested in the midpoint local time. 
And then again, I just have on the top uh, universal time for reference because that is the time that the grape is outputting the data with. So this is just a different um, orientation of the data distribution from the last graph. Um, all I did was I just plotted it. And again, you can see there's increased activity of, um, of TIDs from this region for about 15 to 20 midpoint local time. Uh, the left hand side, the Y axis is the observed hours. So the, the green boxes and the X axis is the time. Uh, so a summary of what I did. So I have my grape set up in the uh, in my house at, in Northwestern New Jersey. It's constantly collecting data and generating graphs. Um, the great personal space weather station makes, uh, it, it has made observations consistent with those expected of traveling ionospheric disturbances. Um, and they appear to be more prevalent during 21 UTC or two UTC, which is as I mentioned, 15 to 20 midpoint local time. And in the future, we hope to investigate observations from other grapes, uh, expand the time range of observations. So as I mentioned, these are very early results. Um, so we hope to continue collecting data and see what we can learn from it. And then with that data, we hope to explore mechanisms for TID production by combining data from multiple grapes. Um, so the 15 that I mentioned that are uh, currently collecting data around the US. And then we hope to compare that data with suggestions for other physical mechanisms for traveling ionospheric disturbances. Um, so my acknowledgments, I would just, I would like to uh, so thank the National Science Foundation um, uh, for their uh, support, as well as the use of WWV. And then um, my research advisor, uh, Dr. Frisell, um, and then uh, the other members that have been helping me with this project, uh, William Lyles of the Hamside community, John Gibbons from Case Western Reserve University, Christina Collins from Case Western, and David Kazdan as well. Um, they're very helpful in assembling and collecting the data uh, that I talk about in this project. And then just uh, thank you again for the use of the open source software that I used in all my code. Um, and then my references and thank you. Does anybody have any questions? So I was wondering, um, Veronica, about these other the, of the 15 grapes in the, in the United States, are they at, mostly at like private houses or like at universities or where, where are they? Oh, who takes care of them, do you know? So to my knowledge, everyone who has a grape is in some way associated with the ham side group. Um, there are a good number at universities and also at private residences. I know there's one um, at a private residence in Colorado, and then there's one um, at my, my research, Dr. Purcell at my research advisor's house. Uh, NJIT, there's one there, there's one at Case Western. So it's a mixture of okay. houses and and universities. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Why did they get called grapes? So <laughs> that's actually a, an interesting question. So you, have, you've heard of the raspberry pie. So oh, that's right. To, to be funny, because of raspberry, they called it the grape. And then there's actually, this is a low cost version. There's actually a high cost version, which is called the tangerine, which is, they just went with the whole fruit theme there. But actually, I like how they got their names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we eat the apricot and the pear and whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. until we get all the fruits. Right, right. And you've just barely started this project. So it'd be interesting to see what your grape uh, responds to as we get into the summer months. Who knows? I'm, I'm really excited to see. <laughs> yeah, great. Very cool. So I was wondering, is Shaf here? There he is. Yes, I am. There you are. OK. So Shaf, you're going to tell us about radio telescopes. Yes. Um, yes, go for it. I have to share. Okay, can everyone see this? Put it in full screen. Yes. 
slideshow. Yeah, we see it. There you go. Okay. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Shaf Server. I am a uh, physics major at the University of Scranton. And I'll be talking about the experimental design of the radio telescope at the university and um, ionospheric monitoring by the SINPI. So um, I, I will be giving a little introduction of the uh, couple of terms that I just talked about. I will be also be talking about the um, how we collected data from, uh, collected and used the data collected from the SINPI. And then I will be discussing the results and um, also propose some future projects. So um, starting from the beginning, what is a scintillation? Scintillation basically is the twinkling of stars we see in the night sky. Um, it is usually caused by two main um, factors, the interplanetary medium and the ionosphere. And one of the goals of um, the research that I'm trying to do in the future is to differentiate those two factors. Um, the SINPI um, is a cheap version of an ionospheric monitor um, developed by the UT Texas, uh, UT Dallas in, in Texas. Um, it is a GPS-based system that we use to calculate the um, index for scintillations. And we refer to the index as S sub four. Um, and we propose different results uh, using that, that index. Uh, I will also be talking about some future projects regarding the Milky Way, uh, the star forming regions in, the, in our galaxy. Uh, we'll also be talking about quasars uh, and the radio signals that come off of them and the Jupiter, Jupiter IO interactions. So starting off, um, we obtained the data from the SINPI team uh, in the form of .hdf files. Um, the data was collected in Texas and Brazil. So the thing about .hdf uh, files is that they are, um, so you need to be knowing about more about um, data structures in a sense. So they compress the data files in certain ways so that um, big portions of data can be accessed without um, overcrowding the system with um, the, the system memory. So we used the .htf files to um, access uh, the data collected from the SINPI. So the SINPI um, looks at satellites in the GPS constellation, which is um, the space surrounded by uh, around the earth and uh, different satellites in this GPS constellation are monitored by, this, uh, by the SINPI. So the S4 index is calculated by using the signal to noise ratio, uh, which is referred to as I in the formula that you can see in the, in the middle of the screen. Uh, we use the rolling function to calculate the averages of the uh, of the signal to noise ratio squared, and also just the signal to noise ratio. Um, again, the it was a little complicated because um, the data was not collected in consistent time cadences, so we had to first figure out how how the data was uh, how the data points were separated in terms of time. So we had to um, figure that part out as well. Anyways, we end up getting the S sub four uh, index by using this formula. And um, we, in addition to that, we also look at um, data from 2018 and specifically the months of January, October and November. And then we compare um, scintillation patterns that we see in this data during these months with some weather activities uh, um, and maybe find a connection with um, sources on the ground. Um, So here's some um, plots that we made from the um, S4, S4 index of the SINPI. Um, the the y-axis that you can see in these plots is the index and the x-axis is the time in universal time. And SVID 03 or SVID 16 is uh, referring to the specific satellite that the um, SINPI is looking at. And you can see um, different patterns here. Some of them are continuous. Some of them are breaking in um, pieces. So it's because uh, the SINPI can only monitor certain um, satellites at certain periods of time in the day. So that's why you see these breaks. Uh, moreover, as, as I just mentioned, we also look at data from 2018, uh, specifically these three months, because they show some interesting activity. As you can see um, in, in the hours from three to six uh, universal time, we see um, a second bump in the, uh, in, in, the SINPI, in the S4 index. So we were trying to understand if this has any connection with um, weather activity in, on the ground. And we collected some, we tried to look up some data regarding hurricanes and the frequency of hurricanes in these months. Turns out um, there's not a lot of data available uh, for January and November. 
Uh, but we saw some uh, activity in October and we can of course see some uh, another uh, bump in October as well. Again, um, the data was collected and uh, has been averaged over 31 days for October and November. And for January, it's just seven days. So um, a little review of what the data just uh, of what we found out from the data. For, so basically we use the SendPy, which is a very cheap um, in a way uh, an alternative to other expensive um, uh, expensive ionospheric monitors. And we calculated a, an index uh, using the signal to noise ratio, um, which is very important in understanding if scintillations are caused by the ionosphere or not. So the SINPI allows us to do that. And uh, regarding the weather activity and its connection to scintillations, again, the hypothesis of connecting those two um, still remains unconclusive. Because again, uh, we did not have um, sufficient data available. So moving on to the um, Scranton radio telescope. On the right side of, uh, of my screen, you can see um, a 10 foot dish. It has a 1420 megahertz um, receiver. Um, I believe it's a cy cy cyber scepter um, receiver. And there's also an MD01 rotor controller on this. Um, unfortunately, because of some um, installation issues, we uh, the motor control the rotor controller is not uh, functional 100%. But that's one of my goals in the upcoming months during the summer to get that operational as well. So uh, we plan to use the data collected from the radio telescope in addition to the SendPi to determine the differences between the factors um, that cause these scintillations, such as the interplanetary medium or the um, or the ionosphere. And in the upcoming slides, I will discuss how um, we can use outer space sources. So we were, an interesting source of radio um, is quasars. Um, these are quasi-stellar radio sources in, the, in, in our universe and um, radio telescopes on earth can detect them. So um, usually these are galaxies with pretty strong signals and, um, and a favorite frequency for astronomers to look at is of course the 1420 uh, megahertz frequency which corresponds to the hydrogen spin uh, flip and using um, Doppler shift and some various calculations um, accounting for relativistic factor as well if, in case of we have uh, speeds approaching the speed of light, uh, we can estimate the relative movement of these quasars compared to the earth. Um, an example of this is the 3C273, uh, which is a third Cambridge catalog number 273 quasar, which moves at about 17% uh, the speed of light. Um, and it is a very good source for studying these interplanetary scintillations. Um, we will also be looking into the Milky Way, which is, of course, our home galaxy. Um, an interesting feature about the Milky Way is that um, at the center, it has a disk-like bulge uh, of uh, stars and gases. And it is about 10 degrees across in the night sky. Um, and, the sh and the shape of the dish is very important in determining um, what resolution we can observe um, if we want to observe the Milky Way and the center of the Milky Way. So a formula that we can often find in um, optics books is um, the one given below, which gives us the angular resolution. Um, and for our dish, which is about 10 feet, um, we get an angular, angular resolution of about 5.1 seconds of arc. Um, again, lambda is the, um, is the incoming wavelength and D is the diameter of the dish. And on the right side, you can see um, an example of a uh, radio image of the Milky Way. Again, uh, radio images can be, um, they can penetrate through clouds of gases. So they're uh, in a sense better uh, for observing um, the center of the Milky Way. Um, it is taken from GLEAM. Um, we will also be looking into some hydrogen H2 star forming regions in, in, in the Milky Way. Uh, an example of that is, uh, the, uh, is the constellation Orion, the hunter, which is uh, known for having those regions. And lastly, um, Jupiter IO interactions. Turns out they also emit radio waves, uh, which of course we should be able to observe with our radio telescope. Um, again, um, the interactions lead to the magnetosphere getting um, get, changing its shape in a sense. And because of that, um, we have certain frequencies of radio waves uh, being emitted. And we hope to um, observe those at our radio telescope and study it further. So a little summary of um, what I just talked about. Uh, we use the SINPI data to calculate an index S4, which helps us determine um, ionospheric activity and scintillations in, it caused due to the ionosphere. 
And um, the hypothesis, of course, that we were connecting weather activity to scintillations still remains inconclusive. And uh, we hope to differentiate ionospheric and interplanetary medium as factors of scintillations by using the SynPy data and the radio telescope. Um, I would also, at the end, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell for helping um, me with the data visualization and Dr. West for advising me with, throughout the paper. Also, I would like to thank the SynPy team under Dr. Rodriguez of the UT Dallas um, and Jose Maria Gomez Socola for, for giving us a tutorial to how to use those HDFI files. Also, TEDx Perth and Wikimedia for providing us with figures. Um, here's my references and Thank you so much. If you have any questions, please let me know. I was going to say it would be interesting uh, with the Orion the Hunter data because we have often with our telescopes uh, showed the public or school children uh, those those interesting regions in Orion. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I think we ought to thank all these students. This has been absolutely wonderful to hear all of these different projects. So uh, thank yeah. you very much. Yes, thank you. And we owe you all uh, money to go out to your local diner to have dinner because we could not take you for dinner this, this year, but uh, uh, expect that. So thank you, thank you very much. And, and now, um, Kevin, we're going to have a, a business meeting and so we could um, let the students go. Yes, yes, thanks, thanks all for, for attending. Uh, and uh, for our um, uh, visitors, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, that uh, we are trying to uh, plan a uh, solar eclipse viewing uh, event uh, for, uh, or, or a video stream, I should say, uh, for June 10th, uh, that, as I mentioned, is at sunrise, which, remember, is at 5.30 a.m., so you got to get up early for, for this one, and it does last for about an hour. And uh, this is going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, so um, uh, take, check that out. Uh, you can get to our YouTube channel through, uh, through our website. You can go to njastro.org uh, and there's a link uh, down the bottom of the page there. So uh, check that out. We'll have some more information about that uh, once it's confirmed. It's not there yet, uh, but it will be there soon, we hope. So uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, next uh, next month, uh, Mary Lou, we have a, a, a little special program uh, set up for next month, don't we? We've, uh, uh, I forget what it is. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the uh, it's the um, uh, the astronomy uh, trivia, isn't it? Oh yes, yes. So Mark Moyers is going to give a astronomy trivia contest of stuff that actually is not very trivial. So okay. we're going to have people <laughs> trying to figure stuff out. Interesting, right. interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Okay. He, so he's, from the, he's from the oh, right. Astronomy Club in Vermont. Right, right. Great, great. So join us on the uh, second Wednesday of, 